So as something you do uh, to live a better, a richer life in the same way that you acquire knowledge to uh, live a rich and full life, we think that engaging people unlike yourself is one of the keys to living a rich and full life. And just like acquiring knowledge takes institutions and people devoted to training you in the art of reading or whatever else, so too you need human beings and a civic in infrastructure to encourage people to connect across difference. And this is particularly important now in our interconnected age, when we come in contact with people unlike ourselves all the time, and a lot of our fundamental human attributes and the way our mind often works is not always conducive to those interactions being positive. Uh, and we see evidence of this, obviously, across the globe. Um, so the way we do this is through a network of life-size, full-body, um, video conferencing environments that are set up in gold shipping containers in environments around the world. These environments are really all over the place. The gold shipping containers range from a tech hub in Brooklyn to a cultural center in Karachi to a refugee site in Lesbos, Greece. And they're all staffed. Well, this gives you some pictures. So in Australia, Nakavala, Uganda, uh, some of these are permanent. Some of them are temporary. I can go into that in a little bit. And they're all staffed by human beings who we call curators, whose role is to activate the space by hosting dialogues, doing hackathons, making art, sharing meals, creating special events, doing educational programming. Basically think of it as literally a global public space, civic space, community center, art space. I'm just showing a couple of quick pictures and then I'll uh, explain how this came to be. So we, you know, we set up in places like Times Square for short periods of time, several months on a go. We're also in sites for much longer. Um, people use portals to go in and have a conversation with a complete stranger, but we also use it to create meaningful collaboration opportunities between people who wouldn't otherwise meet. Uh, we did a multi, uh, multi part series of uh, hackathons between Johns Hopkins and students in a variety of universities in Gaza, where they co-created um, innovations in public health. Um, we've done a major uh, study actually with researchers at Yale and Hopkins, where we've placed portals in heavily incarcerated communities and uh, communities that are under-resourced in America and have had people go in and talk about their views of the police in order to give a richer uh you know view of um i'll come back to this in a second but uh in order to give researchers a better and deeper view of how um how communities experience the police but the point of just showing you this is one of the things they discovered was that by having a portal in a given site and getting a community that often doesn't connect to others around the world it has a political and very concrete consequence, which is, uh, for example, our portal in Milwaukee is in the zip code with the highest black male incarceration rate in America. And one of the things that's striking is when it connects to other communities, even like Newark, New Jersey, there's actually surprise in the commonality of the struggle, especially before Black Lives Matter. But you see that again, when they connect to a group in Mumbai, and hear that some of the same uh, injustices are perpetrated globally. So it creates a different kind of political awareness that right now, I think a global elite has, but frankly, most humanity doesn't. And so the problem of globalization is downsides are very evident to people, uh, job loss, etc. But the upsides of common political struggle, new markets for to innovate and create ideas are not. And so, you know, this is just showing you a range of different things, and I'll come back to sort of why, but this is just a smattering. You know, we also, we've had a portal in uh, a gas station in a refugee camp in Erbil, Iraq. We've used it for legal trainings, educational programming, but also even to connect to the US Congress. And um, just more of that. Uh, and then a lot of what we've done is have portals in different sites and just allowed and created these unique experiences like meals between two groups of people who wouldn't otherwise meet. I'm just going to show you a quick video so you can see what it feels like to be in a portal. Um, and then I'll talk about why and how this came to be. 
And then I'll give you a bit of a sense of the structure behind it, where this began as art and how it became business and what that means. Welcome everyone in the portal. The camera is there. <laughs> is that? That's more. That's more. Yeah, that's more. Okay. <laughs> Can they see us? Hello. Yes, everybody. Is <laughs> My name is Carol. My name is Sam. My name is Kabengera. Most of the food that we eat in Rwanda, but they are fresh from the farm. So this is cassava, and then stew meat, sambusa, and chapati. We also have some sambusa here. I have a question. Uh, is it true that when it rains, everything stops? There is two things about Rwanda that you learn. People are not scared of cars, and people are scared of rain. <laughs> uh, like, what is your expectation when you come to Rwanda or to Africa? The, the genocide is the only thing that I saw on TV. Like, that's the only way the country is represented. We're having a normal life as people from USA. We go to work from Monday to Friday. We go to parties. For me, America is about diversity. The way people are able to have dreams come true. Trump was elected. We hear about him uh, telling people to go back to their countries. There is a lot of racism huh? hidden in America. The people who are at this table right now care a lot about other people. I've heard that women have led Rwanda's economy the last 10 to 20 years. They, they come with this perspective that if a woman can grow and organize the home, she can be able to lead the country. So you should come down and come to visit and see how good we are. I think we would love that. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to show you New York City here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Wanda, it was a pleasure meeting you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for the connection. Thank you for sharing food with us. Bye. Bye. That's an example of one of the many kinds of things that happens in a portal. Uh, and this is just a very cool picture, but it, you know, we had President Obama connecting to uh, social entrepreneurs in all these different countries. And at, I'll talk about this, but as we've grown, one of the things that we're really good at now is uh, we have these local curatorial nodes in all of these different sites. And so we're um, really able to forge, I think, unique and compelling and unexpected interactions. Okay, so let me pause for a second because I, I might not have explained this well. Does anyone have any questions on what Portals is or anything like that? Okay. So I'll now tell you, I think, you know, where this began. Um, I've always uh, been... Uh, so my grandmother fled um, Pakistan during partition in 1947. And this is her. And I was a reporter in 2006, seven and eight. And I actually pitched uh, to my boss, the idea that I travel around the world with a video camera reporting on how people see America. Uh, well, the idea was to tell people, I didn't, the, the idea was basically, I wanted to travel around the world and tell the stories of people behind the news. And one of my bosses said, Americans really won't care unless it's about them. So that's why it became how the world sees America. But basically, I went around the world for two, a year interviewing people in all walks of life about 
um, just how they lived. And I was in many of the 12 different countries. One of them was Pakistan, which is where my grandmother fled when she was a kid um, 60 years before I was there. And when I was in Pakistan, she was really curious about what life was like. And she asked me, you know, to, to walk down the streets where she had been uh, uh, born and raised. And I said, you know, Nanny, don't worry. One day you'll be able to walk around the streets of Lahore as a hologram wearing Google glasses and talk to whoever you want. And this was back in 07, 08. And she passed away some years later. And even though the technology was better than ever, there was no way she would have credibly had a conversation with someone halfway around the world in Pakistan about nothing in particular. You know, she wasn't going to use chat roulette or go on LinkedIn. So I thought, what would she want? She'd want to walk into a coffee shop and share a chai or a tea with someone in Pakistan. It doesn't matter if it's a 12 year old or an 80 year old. And so when I came back to the US after spending all this time abroad, I also missed an experience that I found myself having on the road a lot which was traveling by bus in an evening with no phones, no smartphone or Netflix, and just out of boredom talking to the person next to me. And because I didn't know them and they didn't know me, we had some of the deeper conversations I've ever had. And they stuck with me in a way that when I came back to the US, I never interacted with people for no reason. They were either friends I already had, or I was trying to get a job or it was a date, you know? And so I thought, well, what are people missing? What is it that I'm missing? And it became clear that it was the kind of encounter that wasn't instrumentalized. It wasn't about a particular purpose. And as I was thinking about this, I was a student at Yale Law School, but spending a lot of time at the art school and the architecture school taking classes. And it was really uh, helpful for me to th think about institutional arrangements, which the law school teaches you to do, institutional norms, which the law school teaches you to do, and then actually compare just the way artists were thinking, the way their careers were structured, and the way their institution supported or, or didn't what they do with law, for example. And one of the things art really allowed me to do is think, what is it that the world needs that it doesn't realize it needs? And all these sorts of things came together and I decided to uh, set up um, what I was calling portals at the time between uh, um, two sites as an art piece. And my idea at the time was I was gonna graduate and become an artist. That was what this was. So I, I got a shipping container. I, I put it in my parents' backyard and I uh, outfitted the interior with, um, with tech and used my uncle, who's an optical engineer, to help me tackle some technical challenges. Painted the portal all sorts of different colors until settling on a gold that mirrored my grandmother's you know, religious iconography. And it, it had a sort of deeper sacred meaning, I thought, than any of the other colors I tried. Um, and yeah, got to work outfitting the interior, learning about construction, all sorts of things I knew nothing about, and then painted Portal to Tehran on the front. And actually a neighbor called the FBI because she thought it called it a terrorist cell. And my mom in her office got an, a, uh, a call from an FBI agent, which she can tell you about. And it turned out to be an Ethiopian immigrant who thought this was a really cool idea and wanted to connect to his grandmother using it. Um, and so, you know, everything was fine. Um, I, well, my grandmother passed away. So connecting to Pakistan was no longer the goal. It was to think about what a psychological difference is that's pronounced in individual psyches and in the media. And so I reached out to a friend of mine at the time who was an Iranian American journalist who was spending a lot of time in Iran. And she connected me to Sohrab Kashani, the artist on the right, who has been doing really cool work. Um, the thing that really struck me was he, he hired people in uh, New York to walk around with Google glasses to be act as his hologram. And he'd say, I'm because so, his visa was denied. And so he'd say, I'm sort of Kashani and Tehran, like, who are you? How are you? And there was a human avatar, very similar in concept to what I was trying to do. Uh, so we hit it off. Um, and Michelle, my, my colleague uh, in Iran, and we all worked together. And then in December of 2014, while I was in my second year of law school, we launched or in a third year of law school, we launched a gold shipping container and a gallery in Tehran and a gallery in New York for two weeks, had lots of artist collaborations. We had Yale alum Titus Kafar make art with um, uh, a Yusha Bashir, a sculptor in Tehran. And it was really beautiful because they were cutting up one another's work, putting it back together. And there are no intellectual property or, uh, uh, agreements between the two countries. So it's not clear who owns what. It was really interesting, like art and law, uh, you know, 
interstitches. And what became cool about the project is the more you press it, the more interesting it is because you feel like you're in the same space, but you're not. And so the regulations, the norms of each place carry such implications and you can connect to Tehran in one moment and then as I'll show you, you know, somewhere else next. So it went really well. We got a lot of media coverage and it began to feel like there was more traction here than just a one-off. Um, and so I got an email from a computer science professor in his 20s in uh, Herat, Afghanistan, um, in February, you know, a month after the exhibit, he had heard about it on BBC Persian, and he said he wanted to do it. And so my thought was, okay, great. You know, I gave him instructions. Uh, he went out, he bought a shipping container, he uh, set it up in his university, he had all the tribal elders from different parts of the community come and sort of, you know, sanctify it. Uh, and it's been there ever since. And they actually celebrated their five year portal anniversary with a gold cake uh, not too long ago. And it's been one of our most active sites uh, across the network. Okay, so that I'm gonna pause again. I kind of just gave you the beginning, but obviously there's five years after that where we grow and morph and adjust. And I'm sort of skipping all of that and just jumping to last year. Um, so any questions before I move on? Okay. Can I just ask, are there, so, so they're not all just temporary? Are, are some of them still in place? Yeah, it, they generally are permanent. So they are. yeah, they're generally long-term multi-year placements. So we've been in downtown Mexico City in Chapultepec Park, like 30, 40,000 people pass by it every day. And we've been there for five years. You know, We've also been in Harsham IDP camp, which is a camp of 5,000 people who fled Mosul when ISIS attacked. They've been there for five years. You know, So it's really very different institutions that we're in. Um, but in, especially post COVID, a lot of what we're looking at is, you know, much more long term placements and fewer events um, with the events being, you know, a little more tactical uh, and and the long term placements being really what we're optimizing for. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, just the point. I mean, even my family's immigrants from uh, Pakistan due to partition. Um, so that, that's a story that definitely resonated. But um, the question I had was with the portals, are they live constantly or do you like host events and then yeah. invite people to come in? Yeah, so it really varies. Um, none of them are open constantly. Most of them are open on the upper end four to five hours a day, five days a week. And a lot of them less than that. Um, so that's the sort of range we're looking at. There's some exceptions. Um, where we'll go more than that, but but that's really it. In the beginning, it was 90% small groups or one-on-one -on -one coming in talking to a stranger with no structure. It really changed. I'd now say it's about 75% structured, 25% unstructured. And that's because we have lots of recurring engagements. Um, and with our partners, where Santra Fi is a partner of ours and the Center for Digital Culture in Mexico, they, for example, start building out their own um, curriculum or, or process in the portal and then deploy it across the site. So our institutions become content partners and then they start using the portal much more um, in those particular ways, which is actually great. It, it you know, it's been, uh, it, it was never the plan, but it's been a beautiful sort of outgrowth of its gradual evolution. Um, yeah, yeah, I can talk about more of our partners, but we really have some fantastic groups in our network now from Gaza Sky Geeks, which is a tech incubator in Gaza, to uh, Nakavale Opportunity, which is a tech incubator in a refugee camp in Nakavale, Uganda, one of the largest camps in the world. And so they all um, do lots of collaborations and all these sorts of things, and in more structured ways based on who the institutional host is. So, um, I yeah, sure. Um, I can wait till the end, but I'm curious yeah. about the contractual agreements between you all i mean yeah is there someone who who runs it or yeah yeah so so before covid we had about 25 staff running it um in the not just in the us but 25 full-time staff and then we had about 80 curators around the world who are some were full-time like in mexico we had two full-time staff some were part-time um it really varies because of there's a lot of comp I mean, this is like the worst way to set up a business, which is you have to deal with law in so many jurisdictions. Uh, and, it, you know, like the law is not designed for small companies, frankly. <laughs> so it's very tricky, but there are lots of new tools that help make it more manageable. So, yeah, they're contractual agreements with everyone. Generally, our institution is who we contract with. And then we just have some requirements for how they subcontract 
to their curators, for example. So we don't always hire the curator directly, but we always maintain the right to hire or fire them. So generally, like say we were to put it um, in, a, in, a, in a university, we would often say the university will staff it, we will train the local people, but if they don't show up or whatever, then we gotta find someone else. And that's managed to hold the complexity down from the legal contractual standpoint and payments and so forth. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Sure. Okay, so COVID struck and our whole network closed. Um, and so that was obviously uh, a, uh, a really tough uh, transition, but it did open up some new avenues for growth. And so what we've been focused on the past year is how do we take our ability to curate fascinating voices around the world and our ability to moderate design sprints, hackathons, meals, and apply it purely in the virtual space? And then how do we take our engineering talent and also try to upgrade a little bit uh, virtual conversations? So that's been one bucket, and I'll show you sort of a quick video on that. And then the other bucket is as we emerge from COVID, we've spent six years developing really compelling full body immersive video conferencing. You know, this is a pretty ripe moment to spin that off as its own uh, business. And then to think about how do these components fit together? So let me show you just a quick overview of the virtual, um, what we did the past year. It's a two minute video. Hello, everyone. One thing I know for sure is uh, uh, behind me, uh, 10,000 women. And uh, alone, I'm strong. Together, we are stronger. We are coming with a new approach where we are demanding everyone to take a role in conserving and preserving the environment. Because the environment itself does not belong to the government, but it belongs to the citizens. By being authentic and being vulnerable in front of our teams, I think we're also giving permission for them to take off their mask. Mama told me stay away from these sick villains, steady giving them medicine. Maybe I should have listened. Send me to prison for what I come in peace. I think the colors are so important because they heal um, in ways that uh, you don't need to talk about. Even when I'm painting, some kids try to help me, you know, and, and for me that is like the good thing about to do a mural in the streets because it's not only your process, it's a process for everyone. Ibo landi bara bobo ibo bu mo ibo eni ka ibo bu da ti I want more women to be involved I want more women to be in decision making I want to change the the culture and also I want to make a culture of women's football <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Adios. Bye. Yeah, so so it, it, we really pivoted and we we started building out platforms and really reconceptualizing ourselves a little bit and how it is that we do what we do. Um, and so, you know, as we think about um, our core, it really it consists of two things: the network that we're built we built in our building, our ability to train that network and add value to it for the participants in it. And I can talk about the structure, but I think it's quite, it's, it's, I think we've done a, a pretty good job both of, of distributing curation. So we have nodes of curators around the world. Uh, and then we have a network of global presenters. Uh, and we have a fellowship program that helps train up um, curators 
to organize dialogues on whatever they want. And so, you know, the, the, co the, the topics that are being explored and built are coming from our institutional partners and from uh, our curatorial network. And it's a, it's a really dynamic space actually that allows for us to do and to grow quite quickly. And so even though COVID struck us hard, I think, you know, we're actually doing quite, quite well in this new ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And then on top of that, we're building and we're playing with different, you know, environments that aren't Zoom that allow you to do more than Zoom in a certain way um, where, of course, you have the conversation, you have stuff around it, but then afterwards, you know, packaging that material and resurfacing it so that there's a hub that you can actually dive into to see what happened and to help inform what's coming all on a dynamic web page that is constantly changing and iterating and evolving. So it's actually, it's an interesting space um, that we spent a lot of time on over the past year that I'm, we're pretty confident in its growth. And then we built a full body video conferencing environment um, that we're piloting right now with a cancer research lab. Um, and uh, it is a, you know, just a, this was a, an early iteration of it, like a really good experience, <laughs> you know, very high end, like full brightness. Um, and so that shows you a little bit of just the pivot that we kind of undertook at this point. Let me stop my screen for a second. Yeah, so, um, so there's a lot, I've kind of traversed a lot of different topics and I thought, you know, one of the things I think is an interesting topic to probe uh, is navigating between um, what was and is in some ways an art piece and what has become and very much is a business with multiple divisions. And it's been quite a journey moving between those two um, because they really are completely different languages and sets of norms and communities in many ways with some overlap and some uh, distinction. And so I have some thoughts on it that I'm you know, happy to share. Um, but I thought maybe before I dive into that, let me pause again and see if there's anything you guys want to say or any questions, anything like that. So let me, I'll briefly say my just few thoughts on, on it. I mean, portals began very much as an individual vision in a certain sense. It was very much, you know, like I'm the artist with Sorab and Michelle maybe, but like it was an art piece. And my vision was to have it, exist and be supported in the ecosystem of art. Um, that has pros and cons, you know, and one of the, the difficulties of it is this is quite an expensive undertaking and I'm uh, an unknown, you know, starting this. So the returns in the world of art often are a little bit like the returns in the world of acting. Very few people capture a lot of the pie uh, and there's a long, long tail. Unfortunately, that's becoming tr more true in business too, as oligopolies or monopolies expand, but it's not quite as severe. And so one of the advantages of pivoting from an art-based approach to more of a business-based approach was I could we could get funding from a wider pool of people. And it helped us discover a number of use cases that we never would have imagined in education, in events, in tech collaboration. Whereas if it had remained what it began as just a singular art piece where you go in and you have a conversation with a stranger in another location, uh, and the prompt was what would make today a good day for you, there were really pretty strong limitations on how that could grow without a massive grant. And there's almost no way, I mean, we tried that we would have gotten that. And we were finalists for the TED prize for a million bucks and finalists for a bunch of things. But, you know, even as a nonprofit, we didn't quite hit any particular nonprofit goal as tightly as other nonprofits would. We were just sort of this general purpose public utility that wouldn't quite work. So, so that's just one thought. As time went on and the team grew, it became clear that like my role had to diminish both from a, a branding perspective. I mean, artists often, it's an art or a small group of artists who are the brand. And that is not really viable in in business. I mean, there's some exceptions to that, but generally it's it's a risk. And people who are investing their time, their careers, their money are not likely to want to take a risk on an individual. Um, and there are a bunch of other kind of factors that led, I think, to me um, really dropping out from 
um, having that kind of commanding vision role and pretty quickly, like within a year. I'd say also there's a very different language to art and business. I mean, as I talked about, I remember my art, when I launched this, I remember talking to an artist who said, you've launched it, like you've shown it. Why are you still doing it? You know, like, why aren't you on to the next thing? I was like, yeah. And I used to try to talk about building a beautiful business. And I had a lot of sort of thoughts on how the business itself could be the art piece. And I even launched a conference at Yale called The Legal Medium on how artists use law as material. And some really, really do. But um, the idea of, of growing this and growing it and sustaining it independently as an end in itself is not always, there's exceptions, but it's not always what art institutions are best at supporting, right? Um, at least in my experience. Um, and then the skills are very different. Uh, I think the skills of generating an innovative art piece and scaling a business, uh, they, they tend to be very different. Um, while creativity in business can happen, and it's structured and there's usually group creativity, not individual creativity. And a lot of the skills of business are about proceduralizing and replicating, as opposed to uh, you know, having a unique product every single time. Um, you Businesses that grow have a product that they refine again and again and replicate. And it's just a completely different mentality that actually took me years to wrap my head around. The first four years of Shared Studios, I treated each engagement as a completely new undertaking, which means we didn't really generate the sort of, you know, the, the manuals and the training guides and the processes that you have to, to improve as a group. Um, so I think recognizing the skills of business is very important. And if what you were trying to build is a, is, you know, depending on what you're trying to create. And in my case, I thought what we had built was good and I wanted it to grow because I thought that was disseminating something that was good. And that having just shown it wasn't sufficient. Installing it in the world was the goal. Um, and then I can, and I just so sort of the final point here, but you know, creation versus execution by which I mean, like exactly the point I just made, I mean, to wh where do you see yourself? And so now seven years in, it's very clear to me that the key to our future growth is, uh, you know, excellent management and really good CEOs who are able to sniff out business, you know, opportunities so that we can continue to grow our mission. But the mission, it's really, it has, it has, it, it's different than when I began. When I began, the goal was to create de-instrumentalized encounters between individuals so that they would see the world differently. Now the mission is, you know, a little bit on the other extreme. It's to help promote and create better human interaction. Uh, and then sort of in between is this idea of embracing difference. But just the idea of the mission and organizing people around that mission um, is a, it's a really interesting sort of place to be when politicians and artists try to inspire movements, businesses generally don't, you know, they generally try to mobilize a constituency around a, a mission. Um, and these differences, I think, have really big consequences and are quite hard to navigate if you're an artist dealing with a business person. Um, and so uh, happy to sort of dissect that more. I'm just beginning to think about this for coming in here today, but I don't sort of come with fully fledged thoughts, except to say that's been one of the more challenging parts of navigating this is by moving between these different realms, nonprofit, um, business and art, each side feels that you're trading something critical when you move between them. And holding all of them together is actually exceedingly difficult because of the differences in language and the differences in goal and the differences in norms and values that they each have. But I think it also opens up really unique opportunities that are hard to capitalize on in one domain or another. If I were to start portals as a business, no one would ever fund it. You know, uh, it, it seven years ago, I you know, um, and if if I were to try to build something like this from you know as an art piece, I think people wouldn't conceive of it as art. So anyway, that's some of my loose thoughts to kind of get a conversation going. But I think at this point, my presentation is done. And I would love to hear from him and talk to all of you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a lot of questions. Um, but I want to just give a moment to see if the audience um, has any questions. And you can, you can just raise your hands or unmute yourself or leave, leave a comment or question in the chat. 
Um, Pranav, you raise your hand. Yeah, I did. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for making the time. Um, so one of the things that I'm working on here at, at Yale, in fact, it's part of uh, the Thai City Accelerator program, is a creative writing platform for really writers to share their work and kind of for readers to, to get a sense of uh, the, the creative writing that's out there, both within Yale and across that platform. One of the things that we've been working on is building a community of writers and sharing events, like reading events, where people can read together and also write together. Um, and as part of that community and what I wanted to get your thoughts on is especially very early on, we are trying to develop this and we've got guidelines of what we want this community to look at, look like, but as it grows, it's also going to evolve in itself. So how do you, how did you find that balance when you were building portals of the community you wanted to build and the community that it was kind of evolving in, it, in itself and what advice would you give for someone who's, who's trying to do that? Yeah. So for the first many years, as the community grew and we had new portals, the, the 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 bonds between the curators became and remained very, very strong. And so Lewis, our curator in Milwaukee, is very close to Mira, our curator in Gaza. And all of them work together all the time, each coordinating with one another for their various programs. And there wasn't much structure. And I always used to say at the time, like, look how beautiful this thing is. It organically grew. And like, it, there can't be that many organizations in the world where people from such wildly different backgrounds collaborate daily across all sorts of divides. And it gave me a whole lot of hope. What I learned from that is that works to a degree, but then the scale becomes a challenge, you know, and there's math behind this, right? Once our curator network grew beyond about 80 people, 90 people, um, you start to need to um, assert uh, some degree or, or surface, some degree of guidelines, policies, expectations, and norms. You can't rely on the group to, to necessarily self-regulate. And this is just law of averages or whatever the word is. Like you're going to get some apples who um, will change the dynamic really concretely. And so one of the things I think about earlier, are what are the foundational values that the group holds? and start to articulate them and drill them in. I mean, this is a lesson from business that I think is actually really good. I never read business books. I hated them. But uh, our CEO two years ago gave me a list of 25 to read, and it was like pulling teeth. But I did it. And um, really, you know, incredible collected wisdom in there. And the, the, the one thing they will all say is an organizing mission statement is essential to a successful business, followed by core values that guide everyone and that you can point to when someone deviates from them and if you don't have that it looks arbitrary and capricious and like you're just the, the the god of the group you can't let that happen because eventually there will be a moment of crisis where you can't resolve something um on your own and justify it credibly so what i would just think is take the time to articulate those foundational values express them you can always adjust them based on feedback but if you go in flying blind um, you're just sort of like, there will be a reckoning. And I think that's true for any organization once it reaches a certain size. Thank you. Um, June, you have a question? Thank you, uh, Amar. I really resonate with what you said about um, how different communities, businesses, artists, um, nonprofit, they all speak different languages. I think you muted or... Muted oh God, you. sorry. I was okay, muted no, the whole time. Okay. No, not the Apologize. whole time. It's okay. Um, I so I just really appreciate it and resonate what we what you mentioned that the artist community, the business, nonprofit, etc. They all speak different languages, and it's amazing to see you're able to bridge them and feel create a carved out a unique positioning for the project um, and the vision that you have in mind. I'm wondering if we could share more or dive deeper into the process through which you have this reckoning that, you know, we are having to talk to different groups to test and uh, to find out what our value prop proposition is, so to speak. Um, so we'd love to hear more about that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, for many years, my approach was um, like the Joker from Batman man, which is just, I just do things, you know, I really didn't have a coherent plan. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I, you know, 
I just sort of followed my nose in a state of perpetual anxiety and panic. And whenever anyone expressed any degree of interest, I just sort of jumped. And then really for many years, just didn't have any business or economics and never had any money in the bank account and was always scrambling and, you know, causing hell for my team. Um, and that's because we were just chasing opportunities and not building a core foundation. So, so that's what I wouldn't do, but that's what I did. You know, the, the, the sort of the business approach to this would be to test some proposition systematically for three to four months at a time, you know, and to, uh, put in the work ahead of time to say these next four months, I'm going to test this against, uh, nonprofit sector and see what resonates and basically do market research. Uh, art world, that's a little harder to do because of how opaque and, you know, if, if people could do that for the art world, um, they, you know, they, they'd be like, they'd know how to win a lottery, you know, or, or win it craps. It's, it's, it's just too opaque a structure and they're not enough. I don't know. I, I can't figure it out, you know? Um, uh, and for the non, but for the nonprofit world and the business world, I think it's a little bit less opaque. You can go to people, you can go to nonprofit directors and, and just say, hey, look, I'm not asking you for anything. Here's what I'm thinking. Does this fit? Um, and those sorts of uh, preliminary asks or requests for advice are actually really easy to get. They don't stress people out and you'll learn a lot. Um, so I would I would consider doing that. I wouldn't say that like we've succeeded in, 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 in tackling all of these simultaneously. I just say we bounced between them. And now that we're at this inflection point, you know, the truth is I'm wrestling with what to do with shared studios and portals because we have three concurrent things going on. We have a virtual platform, which is a very viable business. We have a new product in enterprises, which is the full body video conferencing. And then we have the gold portals that were never really a viable business. They just sort of got as far as they did from sheer just hustle of the team. And those might be more nonprofits. You know, it might be about repositioning this and saying this is civic infrastructure. Grant money is matching with civic money. You know, we have three or four partners who activate the space alongside of us because we are a new civic node that goes adjacent to existing nodes. So I, I guess that's a long way of saying you'll feel your way through it through trial and error. Um, but if you can get all of them to, you know, to agree, uh, that would be far better than anything we've achieved. We've just sort of moved between them. Um, and now I have a little bit of a better sense of what to go, where to go for what, um, except the art world, which I still, I think Yi and others are, are far more equipped to talk about um, how to navigate it. But, you know, to me, it just seems like there's so few entrenched, hyper uh, networked folks in that world who carry a lot of influence. And it's sort of like producers in LA. And if you're trying to make it as an actor, and that's just, you know, it's too hard to navigate that. It's too hard to test propositions against it because it's too opaque. And I think that's actually good and bad. Uh, bad because it tends to really disadvantage those with no resources and it tends to highly advantage those who are networked and resourced. Um, and it, it's good in the sense that people don't know how to game it, which I guess makes you more true to your art. But again, that's like a very particular view of art that is a 20th, you know, largely a 19th, 20th and 21st century notion of like the sole genius creator who's plucked from the ether and made immortal. And that doesn't have to be our definition of art. Uh, I just think the, the structures of that art world have established it as such. And I'm going to go in a little digression, which is to say they're good and bad to all of this. Portals, I think, had to begin as an art piece because I was trading on the uh, presumption of uh, disinterestedness or non-instrumentalization that art has built for itself over the years, that it is the place where things are not done for a particular purpose other than contemplation or appreciation. And if I had set up portals as a tech product you know, or a government civic diplomacy product, it, project, it would have been distrusted or discounted. So art actually gave it its initial legs. Um, and that's what's kind of complicated about it. Like I couldn't have started this as a business and made it what it is. It had to start in art, but I didn't think it could live there. And I think these are the sorts of things you're going to figure out based on what your idea is. This is so interesting. Thank you. Wow, that resonates a lot with me. Um, <laughs> um, next question, Maddie. 
Yeah, Amar, I love everything about this. Um, something that I didn't mention, but I am also interested in curation. It's actually what I intend to pursue after my graduate degree. And one thing I love about doing that in a museum space, as contested as those spaces are, is that you have an art object to kind of like serve as a springboard for like these conversations that can happen. But I'm really interested. Um, I'm I'm sure that the the decision to call your staff members curators was a very intentional yeah. one and I would yeah. love to know more about that and also like the the training and the fellowship program that you're talking about because I just think like that's at the root of what I love about curation is the potential for it to le lead to those conversations but I'm I would love to hear more about how you do that without like an object to kind of mediate yeah so the original idea for portals and why it was situated in the world of art is to encourage people to have de-instrumentalized encounters with other human beings. And so um, by, by and, and it, it has, I think for me, resonance in, in a sort of uh, art argument and a bit of a, a religious one. You know, you enter this space, you have an imperfect connection to another human being in another location. It's just you and them. And the art experience, it's not the gold shipping container, it's what you co-create in your shared experience in that space. And so, um, so exactly like in what I said in the beginning, you know, I miss those long de-instrumentalized conversations in the bus with, I'm not needing someone to just get something from them. I think our society so is so leached of those kinds of encounters. It hurts us in so many domains, including our politics, because we can't have meaningful values-based conversations if we're always trying to get something or prove something. So, so that's sort of how I see it in art. The curators, you know, it, it's interesting. It's, 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 you know, it's not an exact graft um, because, um, but a little bit it is. The humans are the art objects. The curators aren't really selecting between them. So that's where it's a little off. They're more like community organizers ushering, you know, but they are curating the conversation and the prompts. So the original prompt was what would make today a good day for you. And for many years, well, still curators co-create those prompts. I think what would make today a good day for you is a, a really beautiful prompt for a bunch of reasons I can get into. Um, so that's why we chose that. Now that we're actually doing this virtual uh, series, it's interesting because it's actually like a little bit of a division of shared studios now, and I haven't been as involved in it. So um, I'm not even sure if we're calling the people who organize the dialogue sessions curators. I think we are. I'm pretty sure we are, but we might be calling them organizers because we're trying to take from the model of community organizing where you have different like tiers of participants and at all levels, they have different skill sets. And so there's a skill set in moderation that we're developing. And that can be everything from hosting, you know, a conversation to having a design sprint, like different modalities of communication and their training has to be on the modality. And then also like the basic, there are lots of sort of best practices about how you connect people, especially when there's wide disparities in power, you know, et cetera. If you just throw people in, it can be quite counterproductive. So that's like one, one ecosystem. There's a sort of ecosystem around the content, you know, like what are the topics people are curating around? We have a great program of like young climate activists around the world. That's just amazing. Um, it's, I think one of the more powerful things we've ever organized and our, you know, our, I'm not sure again if it's curator, but that's another role in our ecosystem, which is like, how do you think through and develop a content-based dialogue experience? Um, but this is the sort of thing I think I'm happy. There's a guy in our team who um, did his PhD in virtual communication actually, and is a fantastic moderator. And he's the one leading our training programs in the virtual space that I could, you know, um, connect you with uh, to learn a little more if we don't, you know, I don't think we've posted much on that yet online. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would, I would love to learn any and all of it <laughs> that you have to share. Yeah, sure. It's, um, I know there are three components and I know that they're broadly broken up into presenter, organizer of content, and then moderator of experience, but how we train within them is, is now beyond, beyond me, unfortunately, I should probably learn more. Great, thank you. We're, we're reaching the hour. I, I would I have a very quick question. Well, actually, it could be a very long question, <laughs> if, depending how you want to answer it. But um, I'll be quick. I, I'm actually really question. I'm really curious about um, 
when you were traveling as a journalist, um, you know, you, you sort of just glossed through that, but it seems like it's informed your, your, your work and it's been a profound experience. You know, is there, is there some like takeaways, like how did that enrich you um, wanting you to, to, to do the portals project? Um, um, yeah, you know, I, I was a journalist and I had a video camera and it's a great excuse to ask questions. And you begin to realize how much people love to be asked questions and to share. And then you think how few conversations there are between different kinds of people. And clearly, no matter what language you use, whether it's business or art, like there's a there's an opportunity here. There's something that's not being captured that all of us would be better off if we captured. So I think seeing that, you know, and sort of feeling that again and again was great. And I think if you don't have the excuse to be a journalist, it's hard to go around asking questions. But when you're a journalist, it's really an incredibly lucky state to be in. And students too. I mean, you know, students have that uh, luxury. It's just harder. We don't have the the language for just doing it for fun, you know. Um, so I would say that was probably the thing that shaped me most. Um, having that permission and then realizing people actually liked it because I think oftentimes you're just like, Oh, I don't want to talk to them. They'll be annoyed or it'll be awkward. And then, um, I guess for me, it was clear that that rarely is the case, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, and how do you bridge the language gap? <laughs> Cause I've, that's I've, a real, that's a real, that's a real challenge. <laughs> I mean, in all, in a lot of these places, I had to have local folks uh, with me who became mm -hmm. good friends. Um, mm -hmm. In our curator network, we it can get very complicated. You know, like when we have Farsi to Spanish, we'll have translators. I'm hopeful that, you know, tech will help this, that there'll be good enough real-time translation. And I think we're getting closer and closer to that. Mm -hmm. But we're not there yet. So we still do it the old-fashioned way. Um, mm -hmm. And we just make the translation part of the experience. We don't sort of try to pretend it's not there. We just let the curators be. Um, and they're mostly multilingual Um in those types of situations, we have multilingual curators. Mm -hmm. Great. And thank you so much, Amar. And thank you all for coming to Beyond the Studio. Um, thank you, guys. It was such an it's honor. a pleasure. And a beautiful yeah. conversation. Fantastic. Thank okay. you so much. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.